Okay, so we are starting the next session. So if you're out there having your coffee or smoking your cigarette, come join us because we are going to continue talking about the theme of crises, less privileged communities. Um, and the next session is called Mobile Resources and Refugee Communities. And we have a slight change of speakers. Uh, we are still talking to people from Communitaire, which is a uh, relief organization. Uh, and we have Brent Dixon here, who is a volunteer with the Greece chapter of Communitaire, and he's going to introduce the rest of the speakers for us. And so we'll have a slight discussion um, and kind of a panel instead of an, an actual one-person talk, so more fun. But we will keep to the to the 30-minute limit. So Brent, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi. So thanks for joining us. Um, this, just really quickly, is Sam, who cannot be here today. Uh, uh, he sends love as well. Um, with me on stage is Angela Marquez, who is our program coordinator um, here with the Greece program. And uh, she'll talk a little bit more about what that's meant, uh, both in working with us and uh, in her past experience. She's been here for a while doing a lot of amazing work. Um, and this is Jordan Daly. And she manages, everybody kind of wears a lot of hats, uh, but she manages, among other things, our uh, granting program, which uh, we use to fund small projects uh, with people within the camps and communities that we work with. Um, so she'll share some stories around that. Um, what I'm going to do is sort of scaffold the conversation up and give you a little bit of background on Communitaire International as an organization, uh, talk about uh, leading into Greece, and then talk specifically about kind of the, the work that we're doing using the Mobile Resource Center here. How many of you have gotten to spend time uh, with Big Blue outside, either at this event or at a previous event, uh, Republica or Global Innovation Gathering? Cool, OK. So you're all friends already. That's great. Um, so a really good example, and this may resonate a little bit more uh, with US audiences, but how many of you have been to Bonnaroo or a music festival? How many of you have been to a really large music festival where when you leave, it looks like that at the end? Let's just say that. Um, how many of you have been to a festival like Burning Man in the US? Um, or a similar festival where there's a bit of a sense of, of community and ownership and principles that, that surround the event. Um, also events like this uh, might count among that. But has anybody had experience with kind of uh, a more intentional style event? So the, the difference between going to a conference, I mean a concert like I was describing is that you feel that you are the recipient of something that you have uh, had no uh, agency over, right? In a lot of ways, you're, you're receiving a gift, you're a beneficiary. Um, at Burning Man, this is what it looks like at Burning Man after it's over. It is completely clean. Um, people stay for weeks after to make sure that everything is perfect because Burning Man creates uh, stakeholders, a sense of shared ownership and community over the outcome of the event, over the gifts that are being received, over what's being created. Um, and this is a much different way of thinking about uh, being a part of something like that than being a beneficiary, one who is just receiving something without any sort of accountability or ownership. Um, we like to use the same way of, of thinking in the way that we think about uh, the, the refugee communities and, and the other communities that we work with at Communitaire is that we're, we, we feel like we're much more in the business of building uh, stakeholders, co-owners, um, than we are of sort of serving uh, things to beneficiaries. Um, to give you a little bit of background, I want to show you, so Communitaire was founded by Sam, the first face, uh, seven years ago. Um, and it was founded uh, uh, as a reaction to uh, a natural disaster. And, and one of the Communitaires, uh, Communitaires operate currently in Haiti, Nepal, and the Philippines. Um, Haiti is probably the, the best example of one. It's been around for years. Uh, it's, it's flourishing, and so it's kind of the best example of what Communitaire looks like uh, at its fullness. Um, so this is Haiti Communitaire, uh, which uh, began after the earthquake. And uh, currently, we'll just walk through the map. 
Uh, it's a pr relatively large campus. There's a workshop and a maker space. There's a center focused on arts. Uh, there's a center focused on 3D printing, computer graphics. Uh, Field Ready has actually done work there and with our community in Nepal. And you can see just a laundry list on the side, on the right over here, of projects that are either coming out of or in motion uh, in the Haiti communitaire space. And these are all driven by members of the, the Haitian community um, where it was is built. Um, and just a few, a straw bale, they've built an earth ship, uh, bottle and daub. I don't actually know what that is. Uh, I learned recently that it's one of the first, that it's the first place that, uh, that Haitian Creole sign language was documented. So you see a lot of like very specific projects that come because they are coming directly from the community uh, of shared owners. Uh, other example in Nepal, uh, again, have partnered with Field Ready there, uh, built it in, in Nepal, uh, in Kathmandu after the earthquake. Uh, and it was the first place to house a humanitarian maker fair. Uh, and yeah, shout out to, to uh, Field Ready. And so that brings us to, to Greece. We started the project in Greece, I guess it was about in March. Um, and it was, a, it was a much different context coming here than coming into a post-disaster scenario. Uh, the, the, the needs were different, the, 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 the challenges were different. Uh, we're, we're not only here, for example, to, to work specifically with refugees, but this project is, is, is as important to support Greeks who are here, who are going through uh, economic crisis of their own. And so integration becomes as much of a critical piece of the work there. Uh, this is a picture from a community from one of the, the squats uh, it's in Athens, uh, City Plaza Squat, that is like one of the best examples, I think, of, of the two communities coming together to support each other. Um, it's a community of, of uh, anarchists uh, on the Greek side and refugees who uh, have basically turned a hotel into a home. And I've never felt a stronger sense of shared ownership uh, and empowerment as when I went there and had, for example, like a 12-year-old kid running the kitchen critiquing the way that I was cutting tomatoes. Um, it was really, uh, it was a powerful moment. And it's a really good example of kind of where we, we can go and can strive to be uh, as we work to bring communities together. Um, Another example that, that I just want to talk about quickly is, is a place called Echo that was a really, really beautiful community center built by uh, a group of people, among them a guy named Dan Tuma, who's become a, a great uh, mentor to us. And this is a good example of uh, it was thriving, and then the conditions uh, have been changing so rapidly uh, that the camp that this community center was built to support shut down. And then they were left with this massive apparatus, um, which they've then found ways to distribute and to use it to support other organizations uh, like ours. And, uh, but it's a, it's a picture of why one of the first pieces of advice that we got when we arrived here was uh, design for impermanence. No matter, no matter what you're thinking, no matter how deep it feels like your root should go, design for impermanence. Um, Angela, I don't know if you want to talk at all about kind of the, any more of the, the underlying context of the refugee situation, like what had been happening, what you had been working on before Communitaire arrived and leading up to this moment. This is me panicking. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a great job. Um, I, I don't know how back you want me to go. So I, I first arrived uh, Greece in February 2016 and um, to work in Idomeni. So it was a pretty calm month until the 20, when suddenly <laughs> the roads were open and in the space of one night we had 90 buses arriving, which means a lot of people. Um, this was the start of a couple of weeks that precede the border closure in the 7th of March. And this made Idomeni camp that was prepared for around 1,500 people in a transition phase to grow in three weeks to 15,000 people with no shelter, with no food, with no wash conditions, with all the obvious limitations that these numbers can represent to any of us. 
um, so this is just to give you the context of how different things grow from one year to the other. Um, since this moment of, of the border closure in Domeni until when I left last year in May, two weeks before the evacuation of the camp, we've been through a month of trying to cover people, literally cover people, literally choosing who is going to have a tent tonight and who is going to sleep outside because the limitations are obvious. Um, trying to find clothes for people, trying to keep water out of tents that are regular Quechua, <laughs> cheap tents. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was a month of struggle and, uh, and delivery. And in between this, uh, in, in the middle of April, suddenly, it, it was literally like this, from one day to the other, suddenly you walk into this camp with these thousands of people living in this very bad um, situation, and you see that there's um, there's a community starting to assemble. You start seeing um, tea tents created by the people living in the camp, not by volunteers. You start seeing um, food, um, vegetables, little cells across through the roads. Um, you start seeing little business. Um, you are received with people that, despite all of that situation, have the resilience to start over, to don't allow themselves to be just receiving in this numb position towards the society, because that's not what drives them. And as, as um, humanitarian workers, we often forget that. We tend to provide and not to see the need of dignity that every one of us um, have. And even when you think you lose everything, you, you struggle to keep that and, and you fight. And, and this was a big lesson that, that I brought from Idomeni, that people are not expecting to be given. People are expecting to be helped to make their way through it, to be helped to own their lives and to own their choices. So after Idomeni evacuation, um, this small community was completely spread all over the north. A lot of military camps um, popped up uh, around Tessaloniki area. The conditions were not perfect. Some would say would better than Idomeni. Some of us who lived Idomeni through almost four months would say maybe it's better to have a tent inside a warehouse, even if it's hot, even if you don't have the proper wash conditions. It's a warehouse, you're covered, you're not in the middle of mud. Yes, that is better but the sense of community that they have built in Idomeni was lost. And people were lost because of that. So this was the beginning of last year's summer. Again, as uh, volunteers, as organizations, as the refugee community itself, as the local community that, that have been amazing through all this process. I can only say that Greeks are the most amazing people I ever met because it's not easy to deal with this. And <laughs> she's not Greek. <laughs> and I'm not Greek. <laughs> no, I'm not Greek. Um, and so th somehow through the last year, there were little communities again being born and so on, but we also had people waiting for almost two years now for their relocation, for their asylum process, for their family reunification, which means that we have people for a long, long period completely out of their usual social roles. They don't own a profession, they don't own a citizenship, they don't own the daily decision of what I'm doing with my life. They are waiting. And this is why I embraced um, Communitaire. It's a transition project for me because I, I have to be on the ground. I, I don't like to be <laughs> behind the laptop coordinating for, for too long and I don't need to go back. But um, it's a, transi a transition project that is also in the right moment, especially in the north. It's in the right moment of transition that it's to bridge this community towards the Greek community that it's itself kind of destroyed in an economical way. And it's itself trying to figure how to deal with all this new reality and how to fit these new people in and how to find their own place in between. 
So what Communitaire brings is not as much as the big innovation of a makerspace. That will happen in the future. That is not where we are now. Where we are now is to give back to the people the power of you can make things, you can own your things. You are part of this. You are building this with us. And that is what creates the community in the end. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was amazing. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so that, that leads to, 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 to what brought us here, which is kind of what we're working on right now is we're creating specifically two resource centers that are designed to provide safe space, tools, resources to help refugee families and Greeks uh, going through economic crisis create the means to empower themselves. Uh, the way that we sort of led to or made decisions about what needed to be made, what the major needs were, is that we first held uh, a couple of design workshops, um, particularly with, with response, uh, local grassroots response organizations, uh, where we worked through kind of at a high level what major needs were, and then specifically looked at the, at what, it, at building out the mobile space. And I mean, left with a spreadsheet of tools and uh, a list of workshops. Uh, Specifically, this is, so you can just see, this is the space that in November we're going to be moving into for the permanent, the Urban Resource Center. Uh, it's in a space called Laboratoire. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the partnerships uh, there. Yeah. Um, and you asked a question at the end of the last talk about partnering with businesses or engineering companies. Uh, so Laboratoire is a partnership. Um, with um, Artbox and Artisitia um, within the city. So it's a 3,000 square meter space. It used to be an old slaughterhouse, which is the meaning of the word in French. And Communitaire is going in as part of this space. And I think that's really important to mention, um, you know, as Angela talked a, a few moments ago about the transition phase that uh, we're in specifically in the refugee crisis. I think there's also overall a very large transition phase in the humanitarian space, in the humanitarian sector. Um, and there's such a shift in paradigm that is happening and is needing to happen. And the only way to do that is through public-private partnerships, right? And through bringing in people that have not been working on the ground for 20 years. And I am one of those people. Um, and so it's, it's uh, beautiful to be able to come in and see you know, the the actual needs here so that we can iterate um, and then be able to look across companies and the private sector and um, create really meaningful partnerships that may not have been looked at, you know, five years ago. Um, because it's 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 necessary, and we're all responsible, right? It's not just the responsibility of what is being deemed the humanitarian sector. So, um, so this is a partnership that that we feel really excited about. It. It's different from communitaire, and I, you know, I think it's an innovative partnership overall uh, to be able to go in and work with people outside of the sector that have made a decision that they want to be a part of integrating the refugee community, the migrant community, with the local Greek founder, startup, creative design community, because that is how we spark local innovation, right? That is how we look at um, you know, urban regeneration. That is how we focus on systemic issues and be able to innovate um, in regard to approach and, and come up with inventions, you know, as you as you asked in, in the last talk. Cool. Thank you. And so that leads us to that in combination with, again, the need to be thinking about and designing around impermanence leads us to uh, the Mobile Resource Center, which originally when we came here the first month, we were all in and focused on we need, a, we need a building, we need land. Uh, and we immediately realized we have to make a switch. And for a while, we were looking around and trying to figure out what are we going to find or use. And uh, magically slash through the amazing generosity of community and powerful support networks, um, uh, we, we met Big Blue, 
uh, through Republica, through the Global Innovation Gathering, uh, and that led to um, this community, which if any of you are in here, I just wanted to say thank you um, uh, for giving us your baby for a little while. And uh, yeah, even the story leading up to Big Blue getting here uh, is, you know, started in, in Berlin Maker Fair. Uh, after that, there was a nine-day trip uh, down from Berlin to Thessaloniki. I think there were eight stops along the way. Uh, asked Vicky afterwards, who's right up here up front, uh, for more details. But all along the way at each of these stops, stopping with different maker communities, communities that were engaged in supporting refugees to actually physically build out, uh, buy tools, fill out the space, and build out so that when it arrived in Thessaloniki, the mobile resource center was ready to go. And it was amazing to see it come together through the work of, of incremental community along the way, kind of like holding the ethos together so that when it came here, it was, it was, it was ready, sort of spiritually and physically. Um, I'll just go through a couple of, of specific stories of, of how it's played out. Uh, when, you, when you go outside and see Big Blue, you'll also see a guy in a cowboy hat. That's, that's Oso. He, he runs it. And so if you have specific stories, talk to him. Um, but this is, this is one of the projects, and it was in a camp called uh, Philoxenia. Um, what's that? Ah, okay. So uh, it is an urban. It's not a camp. It's an urban accommodation. Um, and uh, I don't know if you guys want to talk a little bit about your experience just uh, in that. Um, so Philoxenia is a is an apartment complex, and you know the mobile resource center is has been. And coming in, I, I didn't understand necessarily the amazing, um, the amazing way that it engages people. So um, it's it's that notion of needing to meet people where they are, right? And that that applies to every sector, to every company that you're in when you're creating something. So Philoxenia is an apartment complex, and. Um, we took over the mobile resource center and check it out. I mean, it's like a Home Depot on wheels, right? Or Leroy Merlin on wheels, whatever, you know, you guys, Leroy Merlin on wheels. And, um, and we went and set up shop there and um, with no expectation, right? And that's always how it is when the mobile resource center goes and is outside camps or sets up anywhere. There's no mandate, there's no expectation. It's really like, here we are, this is what we've got come out and see what you want to create. Um, so one by one, um, you know, I, 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 I the, the, there were women that came out and started building, which is a bit rare. Um, and usually there are a lot of the women who don't necessarily feel comfortable building at the mobile resource center because a lot of the men are out there building. Um, so this was a, an opportunity for them to come out and build. And I think two of the women were eight months pregnant. Yes. Okay. Two women were eight months pregnant. Um, you know, another one is waiting is wait is is waiting for reunification with her husband and her children who are already in Germany. Um, and this one woman specifically decided that she wanted to build nesting tables, right? So like the three tables that stack on top of each other. And um, it was such a beautiful moment of recognition for me with this woman who, on one side of the equation, like is, you could say her, her, her world is very challenged, right? Um, and yet it felt like that we had both looked at the same Pinterest page of what we wanted to go into our home or our apartment. Um, so I, I think uh, being able to be there and see women creating and building and you know laughing about the fact together that we had no idea where these things were supposed to go and how they were supposed to be built and her rolling her eyes at being told that a nail needed to go in another way like it's just this it was amazing. It was a it was a really awesome experience, and it's so small, I know, but um, but I would say that was a, a pretty incredible moment. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, just in our last five minutes, I'll share a couple of specific examples, and hopefully, we'll have time to take maybe one uh, question. Um, 
This is the Dervini camp. It's another, it's another uh, camp that we've gone out to. And just to kind of fill out what actually is in the Mobile Resource Center and kind of the, the types of projects that it's prepared to take on, um, there's a, a CNC machine. Uh, there's basically full, uh, a full woodworking set. Uh, it's designed to be modular. And so it, it can sort of transform for needs to even become a pop-up media space if it's needed to be. Um, can it help camps build infrastructure, community gardens? Um, they've been doing a lot of sort of micro furniture workshops or building things from uh, upcycled materials. And so that was the case with the, the Divini camp, which is one of the last camps actually that has people still uh, living in tents. And uh, one, one of the amazing stories comes from uh, Jordan manages the, the, our grant program, and we had a group that came out and said, we need to work out. We have no workout equipment. We're, there's nothing. You should see the stuff that we've tried to hack together. It's the worst. Uh, and so they got a grant, and they built workout stations throughout the camp um, using you know, whatever tools and materials uh, either we had on hand or they, they could put together. Um, Another really amazing example is so we go out to the side of the camps uh, to to avoid sort of dealing with uh, sort of political issues going inside. Uh, we had a guy who came and was taking measurements and going back and forth, back and forth. And in the end, uh, he came back and he said, uh, "Look what I made!" And he built uh, a wall and a door onto his tent so that his his uh, his home could have privacy and protection uh, in the course of a day. And that was a pretty amazing thing to see happen over the course of, yeah, like a, like a half day of time there. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing what the community brings to the table here, both with this and as we transition into the, the more permanent space here in city center that's really going to be strongly focused on uh, integration. So with that, I think, do we have time for maybe one question? Um, I'll have to steal one of the mics because we do need also to hear the audience. So we do have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if you do have a question, please raise your hand so that I can see you. Do we have any questions? Yes, we do. All right. Just wondering, if you could make a wish today, if you could expand one thing or get more money from somewhere or get more support from somewhere, what would you wish for? What's the one thing you're missing right now? Hmm. That's just great, one. That's a great question, yeah, just one. What do you think? Mm. It's a bit of the theory of change approach. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing question, and I, I say that that's such a that's such a pushback when someone asks a question. No, is when you you know when you're in a situation uh, and you're in a you know a, a startup or you're looking at something new that you're creating, you you get there's this period of time, and then you sit down and you're like, actually, if someone did hand me ten million dollars today, like, what are we doing with it? You know. Um, so I, I, th I, think, I think the answer to your question is twofold. Um, and then if you want to jump in and say anything. So I think, um, I think the public-private partnership component of this is really important. Um, and I, I think that, and if, if there's, um, and it's not, it's not, it's not looking within the aid sector. It's not looking within the humanitarian sector. It's looking way without that sector. Um, it's looking outside into companies like Google, companies like Tesla, companies like big organizations that have the ability to uh, create smaller foundations within their company and smaller innovation labs that are then able to support things happening on the ground. Um, and you know, we know that there is like a lot of politics, and you can argue that that would be the same route as going as looking at a huge humanitarian aid organization when you start bringing in much larger players. But I think that there is a bit of a um, cognitive dissonance or a disconnect between, um, you know, what 
what the actual need here is now from a transition standpoint and what it was. Um, and you know, the media does not do an amazing job of getting to the place of the transition place and then talking about what is needed now, right? So for all intents and purposes, you know, they're, they're not, the media is not covering the crisis here as it was. Um, and so you've got so many people that are now displaced and that are no longer able to go to that one spot within the refugee camp that was their that was their vortex right that was their community center um, so I, I think being able to create um, the 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 partnerships with larger organizations that are then able to fund more ways to build community and I think that's that's the greatest need is finding more ways to build community and the tactical things to do that are transportation from all of these places. It's a communication tool to all of these places. It's like a central command of where the support system is, what is available, and then what are the actual tactical things that are being done? What are the disciplines that are being offered? What are the language skills, the support system, the vocational skills being supported? Um, and so we're, we're collectively here working to do that um, and many different organizations are uh, but I think that it's you know it's it's a big ship to steer so it requires a lot of people to do to partner on that yeah and so I'll just close out with a uh, dovetail off of that which is that I think we're still learning about what the community organizing model is community community organizing has been at central to understanding what to build and how to build it for communitaire. And actually one of the first conversations I had with Angela was after a design workshop where we kind of had gone in, you know, design thinking solves all the problems. We just ask people what they need. And we had strong feedback that was don't go into camps and say what do you need because they've been inundated with that. Protect people. And so we're still learning, I think, about exactly what it means to build uh, an organized community, find network nodes, um, empower people to, to kind of lead the process from within and do that with the kind of sensitivity and thoughtfulness that's required um, within the specific context. Um, and with that, Thank you all so much for your time and uh, for your generosity, especially those of you who've contributed and been a part of making this, this happen. We are uh, really grateful for you. Thank you. All right, a round of applause for Brent, Angel, and Jordan. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to take a 10 minute break on stage one. So please be back at 12.30 for talks about internet censorship and internet freedom and access to the internet. Don't forget to get one more coffee.